Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, since you just heard a talk about the nice sender tool, uh, you will now get sort of a bit of a follow-up for some purposes. Uh, we're talking about the CPU command. Uh, first, a bit of an intro, and uh, thank you actually for having me back here because I've been here many, many times at OpenSUSE conference. Uh, usually I'm a web developer or an app developer by day, uh, but I somehow also got into firmware and operating systems. And at some point I started to write more and more code in both Go and Rust, which are really, really nice languages. Um, I'm not going to say which one is better. Anyway, um, so yeah, in 2019 I also gave a short talk here, uh, back then on open source firmware. And I told you about everything we're doing in the open source firmware community when we had chats. Uh, so if you don't recognize it, the mascot logo down here, uh, this is Oscar. Uh, Oscar is the mascot of the open source firmware conference. And so today I brought another friend, uh, which is this, if you don't recognize it. This is Glenda. Glenda is the mascot of the Plan 9 operating system. Um, and Ron here, who just talked about the center tool, uh, brought a tool from Plan 9 to the Linux world, which is, frankly, CPU. Um, so here is a quick overview of what I'm actually talking about today. Um, I, I want to get to speed when it comes to building and distributing operating systems. And so I uh, did a little, um, I, I asked this question on Twitter like, okay, what should I talk about here? Uh, I did a little poll. Uh, and at some point, Alexander Graf actually told me, hey, um, when you talk about CPU, maybe that is something we can actually use in OpenQA. And I thought I would pick that up and we will come back to that later. Um, yeah, but first I will start with uh, distributing operating systems in general. Uh, talk a bit about the other end, so to say, uh, porting firmware, which is a necessity in the first place. And then how we can speed things up to, you know, get close to each other. Uh, and maybe we can find something uh, which is a very thin uh, but robust contract between us. So to distribute an OS, um, let's see what you actually need to do. First of all, of course, you need to build software, right? And um, OpenSUSE is doing that since I don't know when. Um, and of course, not only the distro can do it, but also the end user, right? So you can also uh, just give uh, source access to users and know, okay, if you build that source for that and that distro, it also works fine. Otherwise, you get something pre-built. That's like the ideal case. So I don't really need to care about like, you know, patching weird things in software. Um, but yeah, that's actually something that the distro then would need to do, right? So they need to deliver tool chains, need to make sure the tool chains work for all the sources that are delivered with that tool chain at that, you know, point of the distro. Uh, and you need to meet certain assumptions. Like most, uh, most software has some assumptions about a certain built environment, right? Like libraries being present and so on. Um, NixOS has put that to an extreme. They say, okay, don't assume anything. You may get a shell. Um, but, you know, the general case is dev developers also don't really need to or want to understand an entire operating system. They want to, you know, work on their code mostly. Um, so yeah, this is what OBS is doing now. So the OpenSUSE build service is a running instance of Open Build Service. It's building all the packages that we could ever install, right? So it's building as a service essentially. Um, that's excellent. Um, so now if I already have my operating system, the base distribution, I can uh, install all the software from there. But now to have an operating system in the first place, I need to be aware a bit of processors and architectures and so on. And you know that means I need to deal a bit with very low level stuff. Uh, and that's where platform specifics come into play. So if you want to install an operating system today, you already need to know what architecture your machine is, right? So let's say you buy a new laptop, let's say it's a Chromebook and you want to install, let's say OpenSUSE on it. Now you need to know whether it's an ARM or x86 laptop. It's you know, becoming a thing that not only x86 is present, but there is many, many different architectures now. Well, getting more and more with RISC five, and I don't know what's going to come in the next years. So that's mostly dealt with by the kernel, of course. So the kernel knows really, really uh, details of most of the hardware. So arguably it's the lowest level part of the operating system. Um, but that's actually a lie, so we know that. 
there is something underneath us. Um, so, yeah, but ideally, if you know, if you can assume the architecture is the base thing that we build on top of, then we only have one kernel and one distro image per architecture. That's the ideal case. Uh, so I looked at the risk five images for OpenSUSE and I, I noticed something and I asked myself, what, wait, 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 what happened here? There is a specific image now for the high five unmatched, that's a risk five development board. Now, if you imagine seeing this year for, I don't know how many development boards are out there, you would end up with 500 downloads and people would probably confuse them because sometimes they have really similar names or revisions, which may even be an entirely different architecture again, which is why you sometimes break your phone by accident when you want to install a custom ROM. Happened to me. So yeah, how can we fix this? How can we get back to this? Okay, we only have one architecture, one image, one kernel for that. Um, that's a very good question. I think we need to revisit some assumptions and that's uh, where it's getting a bit dirty in a bit. So uh, first of all, we might want to talk to chip vendors. Um, so with all the different chip vendors out there and all the architectures, that already implies some sort of fragmentation, right? So if we can align on at least some things um, then maybe that would reduce or, or solve the problem already. Um, so yeah, w what made the operating system eventually assume? That's our core question. I'm not going to deliver an answer here. I'm just making a proposal in a bit. And yeah, before I'm doing that, I want to talk a bit about porting firmware because that's what I'm currently doing a lot. And hello, Risk Five. So uh, we're currently working uh, a lot with Risk Five boards. Um, the High Five Unmatched that we just saw is one of those development boards that I don't have, I have a few others. Um, and here is an example of a boot flow. And this is not yet involving your kernel. This is already four components before you. One of them is vendor specific. They call it boot zero for whatever reason. Uh, and then they hand over to a few different stages. There is U-boot, most of you will know that from the ARM world, I guess. Uh, in uh, RISC-V specific, uh, specifically, there is something called SBI. There is one implementation called OpenSBI, all good. And you know, then you would even end up in Grub again. And if you now think, hang on, U-Boot is already a bootloader. Why do we need Grub now? Um, I don't know, but I want to fill up the picture. Yeah, so um, is that a question or an answer? Oh, yeah, yeah, someone is throwing in that this would be for unification. Arguably, okay, that would be one solution, um, maybe. But yeah, I, I, will, um, I will get back to that again because it's not actually that simple eventually. So yeah, this is what we actually want to have, right? We actually want to have that operating system that runs on top of everything else. So now this picture here is actually just a small uh, picture. This here is the bigger picture of it. And now you see, okay, what, what you just uh, said, um, well, Grub fills in here to make a unification, right? So it's coming after U-Boot and uh, the SBI thing that you saw in the previous picture. Now, please don't ask me why the errors here are a bit different. So here we have U-Boot first, here we have it last. That's a, a detail that shouldn't really matter too much to you. Uh, but what this here is sort of trying to do is separating the firmware and the operating system, having this, uh, this firmware on the left and the operating system on the right, right? So now the problem here is, and that's true for many of these development boards, they put everything on an SD card. Now, if you want to go and use some partitioning tool and you know, change some partitions, uh, you would probably just blow off the system because it's not aware of these very specific things that you sometimes have somewhere in the very front or maybe somewhere in between there is also something um, that actually happens. So those are vendor specifics we would like to get rid of. So there might be a, a better solution to this, but this is now sort of the reason why you end up with having a full image that you would write to an SD card and you end up with a lot of images rather than having one image that you just put on the SD card but you would know there is a base firmware already on the board that always works. Um, so yeah, this, this is sort of becoming a mess. And to point that out a bit more, uh, let's look at another example here. 
So yeah, why, why is this happening? And I'm not making all of this up here, right? So I just added all the uh, links here and references so you can also uh, verify this. So we sort of have a similar separation here. So we have the firmware. Now it's not left to right, it's top to bottom. Uh, but anyway, this part here, which would be the firmware, would again be on some storage part. Uh, and then you have something in between uh, the Linux kernel in this case, uh, and then the operating system, but arguably we want to have this sort of unification where actually this kernel would already be part of your operating system. I'm not even sure if that is just um, yeah, to point out that the kernel is there. Uh, but yeah, I don't really want to see any of that stuff here when I install my operating system, right? I want to install, I don't know, Fedora, OpenSUSE, maybe Debian. Um, so what I've been doing now for quite some time is uh, porting firmware to REST. Uh, so the Orbit project, that's one of the firmware projects I work on. Um, it's really a downstream fork of Coreboot. If you don't know, we're just rewriting things now in Rust, um, arguably because the language is much easier to read in that way. And I've actually heard that uh, even from people who uh, you know, are working in the industry or talking to people working in the industry, that they are looking forward to seeing more uh, Rust code. So yeah, my current target is the Vision 5 board. Um, if you don't know that one, uh, never mind right now. Uh, so that's where the example here comes from. So now this is all nice, but I actually wanted to speed things up, right? So I want to get rid of having to actually deal with firmware. Um, so I want to propose something and I want to offer uh, something we came up with, uh, which is called Linux boot. In fact, I wasn't the one coming up with that, but yeah, I'm contributing a bit here. Um, so. The idea is we just take firmware for granted. We focus just on the operating system itself. And this is what it looks like. We take whatever firmware comes before us, we add a Linux kernel to that, and a simple Netron file system, which really just has a very, very few binaries that we really need, and then we can switch over to our operating system, which could even be Windows in that sense. We don't really care. So we provide a full bootloader environment and everything in that Netron file system and now you have something that you should be able to count on. Um, so it's abstracting everything away that you know came before you, which can be, as you see here in the picture, it can be U-boot, can be core boot, or it can be what we're now working on, or boot. So this is what it looks like with or boot and Linux boot. We have or boot itself, it just does your hardware initialization, and then it executes the payload, which in this case now is Linux boot. So Linux boot really just means you have a Linux kernel, within a Netron file system. We usually just build it inside, so eventually you have one image that you could just write like that to a flash part on your board. So you have Orboot inside of Orboot, you have Linux boot as a payload inside of that, you know, you have the Netron file system which contains your eventual binaries. And that's including the bootloaders. Um, but I want to include something in addition and that is called CPU. And CPU run, brought that here to Linux. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's just one daemon that you actually need to run. You can then leave out all the other binaries, which means you save plenty of space. Maybe a text surface if you're uh, concerned with that. Um, but eventually, if we deliver this one daemon, and that's everything you now need to talk to, and then you can just boot your operating system or just instrument the device in any way, then we have like a very, very thin contract, right? And so, yeah. You can really do with it what you want. Now, I want to describe a bit what it actually is because now I'm just teasing you a lot. So think of it like some, some small little stub, something that is really just this small daemon that you can talk to from the outside. So essentially, if you come from security, think of remote code execution as a service. Uh, but essentially, you know, I mean, we also do security, right? So we do SSH keys and stuff like that inside of it, uh, which is an implementation detail, but essentially, it means that you can take any of your gadgets, development boards, and so on, and talk to it from the outside uh, via the network. And now on the other end, when you are on your host system, which is talking to that remote target, you just bring anything from your file system to it. There is a namespace where you can just define everything that you want to be able to see on the other end. So now I want to give you one uh, simple command. So uh, instead of you know, just 
moving SD cards around and so on, like we saw in the previous pictures, you would need to burn an image, and if you wanted to change something or maybe write a new image and so on, you would need to move around the SD card. That's a bit of a pain, um, so instead we want to use one simple command that is CPU. We just say CPU, the target device we want to talk to, and the local application that we have on our machine, we're just going to execute that on the other end. So we can just reference files locally. We can also add arguments and so on. And now comes the fun part. That's a bit of an advanced thing. You can even use kexec, right? So you could also just execute the next kernel, which might be very useful for testing operating systems, right? So this is what it looks like. You use the kexec commands. That is currently on your machine, but it will be executed on your remote, and you pass along your next kernel. Well, and your command and arguments, whatever you may need. And at that point, I think I will have the time to give a little demo, and yeah, time looks good. So I brought with me a little virtual machine here. This is just QMU running. Uh, this is now emulating x86, uh, which doesn't matter too much. It just matters for the binary that I want to run. So down here, um, I have a command that I want to run locally. It's called FB status. Uh, FB status comes from the Go Crazy project by Michael Stapelberg. If you don't know about it, Go Crazy is a really awesome project. Um, and I just talked to him recently at uh, the uh, GPN, Gulasch Programmiernacht. And I said, this is a really nice tool. And I want to bring that also to other devices because he's mostly working with Raspberry Pi. Uh, so the first thing I said was, okay, let's uh, run it over CPU. So now I'm going to use the CPU command. Uh, I'm going to run it against local host. That's because I bound the network from the QEMU instance to my local machine as well. Um, and I'm going to run FB status here. Now, this is what is going to happen. The FB status tool is being used on that remote. It becomes visible there. It's being executed. And now it's even giving you screen output. So arguably, you could use that, for example, for, I don't know, a kiosk or something, right, where you want to display, I don't know, current offers or a timetable at the airport or whatever. And you can have a completely stateless node on the other end, which is just essentially for talking to whatever screen or something, right? So yeah, but uh, as I'm saying, this is stateless, so the command is not really there. So if I cancel it, you would just see the picture remain on the screen. Now it stopped running, right? Uh, and I could also do anything else. I could also, uh, I don't know, I could also draw a gopher if I want it. Um, I have another command for that, which is the FB splash command, which is just for, you know, drawing an image on the screen. Uh, but I could also read out something from uh, from that system. Let's say we want to see, I don't know, uh, the command and that was run there. Uh, you know, this is the uh, frame buffer you see. Uh, that's why you get this size of an image. Um, yeah, so we can do anything we want, essentially. So now back to the presentation. Uh, second. We're here. So how do we leverage this now for distro testing? Um, if we use Linux boot and we add CPU to that, now we can define a well, we define a well-known state for the system, right? So whenever the system resets, we end up with CPU D running and it's ready for being instrumented. So if you, uh, if you have done a lot of testing and QA, you know that always when you have done any test that you did, you want to reset back to a known you know, good state so that you can always uh, be sure that there is nothing left from a previous test case which might spoil the next one. So yeah, now all we need to do is we need to attach to the network. Arguably there are some development boards which do not, uh, do not offer like an ethernet adapter or something. Uh, but let's ne neglect that for now. Like most SBCs that uh, you know, you can get off the shelf, which are very popular, actually do have one. Um, now, when we power on the board, all we need to do is to check for readiness, right? So, if we have like a test runner for a QA tool, um, we, we would need to have this one assertion in the beginning. So, yeah. Now we have uh, Linux deployed with TPU D as the init. We also call that a CPU kernel. And so in the next step, we now can build our distro and we can run it. So the question is, how do we do that? Uh, one simple way is, and that is uh, being done in 
embedded development a lot, you can use NFS as a remote root file system. So you serve the file system over the network instead of moving an SD card around. Uh, there is another solution for that, which is to uh, emulate an SD card. So there, there is some hardware adapters, you know, which can emulate like uh, being an actual SD card. That is one possibility. Uh, but yeah, this year it might be a lot more flexible. And actually we want to get rid of having a specific SD card image anyway in, in this sense here. So yeah, I, I hope this will uh, speed things up much, much more. So yeah, the only thing now we need to check for, you know, the very simple QA check is does it boot? If yes, then yay. Otherwise we found a bug. So we need to see, okay, what made it into the distro recently? You know, what may have caused a regression? And so, yeah, I looked at OpenQA because OpenQA is already doing this for a bunch of uh, things, but mostly virtualized, uh, but there is already some hardware attached. And well, that theme here, uh, I cited that again because I think it's a bit hard to read. Uh, life is too short for manual testing, right? So we want to have that. And now there is one thing missing and that's risk five and that's what, what I'm here for to, you know, see if we, uh, we can figure this out. Um, if we can get our Orboot ports finished to that point where you always end up with CPUD, now you have this very, very simple thing that you can always test against. And if we have, if we have that on any board that you want to test, you even have portable tests in a way. Because essentially if they all, you know, give you the same sort of output, you can even use the same assertions. Now, a few things on testing strategies, I already um, briefly talked about that. So you want to be able to test a few different uh, setup variations, right? So for example, the kernel command line may differ uh, between different test cases uh, for some specific things uh, that might be necessary sometimes. Um, you want to do assertions, you can do that on the serial console or in video output, which is what OpenQA is currently doing already for hardware tests. And of course, always remember reset, you know, to your well-known state for the next test case. Now, what are the requirements? You need some other piece of hardware for the monitoring, for doing that reset, you know, for the overall instrumentation. Um, some boards even have like a special boot mode button or something that you may also want to use if you want to test firmware, but we're now lo just looking at the operating system, right? So you need to hook up your HDMI, UART, some GPA open for the reset, and that's it. And for that, you can use, I don't know, a Raspberry Pi, uh, 3MDAP, a Polish uh, company made a device called RTE, which can also do the instrumentation and so on. And eventually you need some glue logic, right, in your CI tool. So if you want to try that out, you're welcome to join our workshop uh, today at 5 p.m. in the other seminar room. And if you want to prepare, uh, please have Docker installed or QMU, so what I just showed you, the demo. Uh, we have binaries for that that you can use to try it out. Uh, and optionally, if you also want to try out some software that is written in Go, uh, Go 1.18 would be the version to install. Yeah, with that, thank you, and I'm ready for questions. <laughs>